Yesterday, Politico, which is a Beltway Insider News website, uh, they published a story really stoking fear and fear of what I've already alluded to, Christian nationalism. Now, according to this narrative that they're pushing, the election of Donald Trump in November would unleash an army of Christian nationalists throughout the federal government and that their intent would be to install a theocracy. Now, listen, as, as crazy as that may sound, I can assure you that we should expect more of these type of stories as they, I, I believe they're representing a coordinated effort, uh, the purpose of which is to rally the left, but probably even more so, the purpose is to intimidate and silence Christians who embrace a biblical worldview, individuals who reject the radical lurch to the left that we continue to see in our country's politics and culture. So what should we make of all of this and how should we respond to it? Well, joining me now to discuss this is Dr. A.J. Nolte. He's Associate Professor at Regent University, and much of Dr. Nolte's Ph.D. dissertation research really dealt with this whole issue. He studied the topic of nationalism and faith. So, Dr. Nolte, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to have you. Thanks, Jody. It's great to be here. Well, thank you so much. All right, look, before we dive in, let's let's step step back and talk definitions. I think a lot of people are confused on what we're even discussing, what we mean by Christian nationalism. And I want to start with what the left claims Christian nationalism to be. Here's how filmmaker Rob Reiner defined it. Clip the five, idea please. is that America was a, uh, a born as a white Christian nation, and these people are virulent about returning to that, and they'll do it at any means necessary, including and up to including violence. And we saw this happen uh, on January 6th in America. All right, listen, there's a lot there, but that's one definition that the left has. Um, how else do they define Christian nationalism? Well, it's interesting because the definition of Christian nationalism that you so often see from the left um, tends to be, uh, it tends to be a coat that is cut to fit uh, whatever it needs to fit at any given time. Um, but the probably the most widely spread definition of Christian nationalism is from a book by Taking America Back for God by two scholars named Perry and Whitehead. And what you find actually when you look into their, their data and the way they constructed their data is that they took six questions, which are generally good questions if you're trying to measure social conservatism, right? Those who, who favor, for example, uh, the idea that America, uh, that Christianity was important for the American founding, um, you know, more traditional ideas like prayer in school, opposition to abortion, same-sex marriage, and so on and so forth. These are really good measurements for social conservative attitudes. And they say these are measures for Christian nationalism. Um, so what you often find is that Christian nationalism is basically just what we would traditionally label as social conservatism, sort of relabeled. I would say Reiner, though, kind of gives the game away when he talks about white Christian nationalism, because another thing that you often see in the literature, um, to be fair, not in Perry and Whitehead, but in some of the other literature on this, is a conflation of white ethnic nationalism with Christian nationalism. Um, and so so I think there, there's a couple things going on, but a lot of the definition is actually uh, that the left is using kind of obscures things more than it actually clarifies. Well said. It, it does obscure things, and it does take basically just conservative Christians and redefine them to be what uh, the, the left portrays as a danger to democracy. And th there is a difference between Christian nationalism and Christian principles upon which right. our country was founded. And yes. so this creates a, 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 an issue, too, to where they're really bringing in the argument that if you hold to Christian principles, you are a Christian nationalist and you want to have a theocracy and force people to comply to Christianity or be punished. Am I, am I walking up the, the an accurate path there by saying it? Yes, and that, that certainly is the implication of that. Although I want to uh, try a thought experiment with you here. Um, so imagine a situation in which a Republican president goes to a church uh, a church that has been prominently associated with uh, Republican politics in the, in the past on a federal holiday 
and gives a speech where he talks about how New Testament principles ought to be the basis of uh, our politics here in America. Would the media label that as Christian nationalism, do you think? Absolutely. So what's Seems interesting is when... Would... Yeah, I, I would agree with that. What's interesting is when Joe Biden went to Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is an African-American Baptist church in um, Atlanta, which has a long association with, with civil rights. Um, many Democratic leaders, including Senator Raphael Warnock, uh, have been associated with that church. And over the Martin Luther King holiday, I believe this was in 2023, uh, he gave a, a speech there talking about how New Testament principles of, of peace and justice ought to underlie what we do as Americans that somehow was not considered Christian nationalism. So it, it's interesting, even in the sense of when we're we're talking about uses of the label Christian nationalism, um, it kind of depends on who is using the New Testament and whether the media outlets in question like the use to which the New Testament is being put. So again, it's not a clear inconsistent, it's not even clear and consistent about the idea that any use of the New Testament for political purposes is Christian nationalism. Excellent point. I would like to uh, find that clip uh, of that that, uh, that you're referring to. That uh, could be a powerful tool. Uh, you, you've conducted a ton of research, but, but a lot of research specifically on the, uh, how the left in other countries ha have used fear of religion as a political motivator. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, and, and do you think that's kind of behind the scenes, what's going on here, the same tactics it played now? Yes, so one of, my, one of the countries that I researched for my dissertation was Turkey. Um, and when you look at Turkish secularism, which you know, many people in the United States have a, a favorable view of, but you know, as a scholar, I'm looking at what did they actually do and, and why and how did it work, right? So one of the things that the Turks did was um, oftentimes the fear of religious reactionaries coming back in and imposing Islam on Turkish society was used to mobilize constituencies that supported um, Turkish secularism. And this was, the Turks referred to this as urtika or religious reaction. And we saw this mobilization pattern even under Ataturk in the 1930s, um, but it definitely sort of continues on. And what ended up happening in Turkey was, I would say, they, they generally pushed most of the Islamic believers in Turkey more toward radicalism uh, because they were using this extreme fear language such that any kind of public expression of Islam was, you know, backsliding to the bad old days. Um, and then I started looking, you know, comparing this also, you saw some of this in France after the French Revolution um, and connected with the French idea of laïcité. So there is kind of this tendency among movements as they become more identified with secularism uh, and, and particularly a more aggressive form of secularism that wants to remove religion or any public expression of religion, at least uh, from the public square then you do start to see this kind of attempt to mobilize fear of religion uh, to, to motivate secular constituents in opposition to their, their political opponents. Um, and, and Turkey is kind of the, the best example of that, but I would say, you know, France would be another example. And, you know, that did kind of get me wondering about some of the mobilization, particularly um, what I would call, what I would describe as the handmaid's tale discourse uh, in the United States over the past eight to 10 years. Yeah, I mean, right now, President Trump, uh, the, the spokesperson in Bowdoin, uh, Biden's camp is saying uh, former President Trump would be straight out of Handmaid's Tale, just what you said. Uh, why, why do you think they keep going back to this? Because what you just described seems to be exactly the mm -hmm. tactics that they are using here, use, trying to create a fear of religion and, and make that a, a horrible thing that is a threat to democracy here in America and now they're trying to attach President Trump with that. The Handmaid's Tale, I would say, if you were looking at like a perfect piece of propaganda designed to motivate fear of religious reaction and, and sort of drive particularly um, secular women to the polls in, in reaction to that fear, I mean, The Handmaid's Tale was, was tailor-made for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, it portrays a, a very uh, misogynistic, theocratic, um, society, um, it, it does it in ways that if you actually look at, at the text of what happens, uh, that, that twists strip scripture significantly in ways that none of the uh, so-called Bible-believing Christians that it portrays would would countenance. Um, and it takes, you know, some, some very, I would say, perspectives that exist in the fringes of 
um, you know, what I would call Christian reconstructionism. It takes them and, and even twists them um, to fit into this this kind of horror show. So um, it's it's apocalyptic for sure. Um, but it fits in with that that approach that kind of mobilize the fear of secular, uh, you know, the, the secular fear of a religious reaction. Um, and then, of course, you have the production of The Handmaid's Tale as a TV show, which takes what's already there in the book and amplifies it even more. Um, and so I think it, it, there's there's been a deliberate attempt to craft that into sort of a um, a narrative that's going to appeal particularly to uh, secular, educated um, women who do not attend church and are not, you know, familiar with Christian belief, to try to make sure that they're going to come out and vote uh, against President Trump and and against any of his political allies. Dr. Nolte, let me play a clip for you. I'd love to get your reaction to this. This is of uh, Heidi Prisbel last night on uh, MSNBC, and she was listening to what she described as extremist Christian nationalism ideas and. I referenced a piece earlier in the program that she co-authored, but let's play this clip, uh, clip four, and I'd love to get your reaction to this. We're talking about here, not just isolationism, immigration. We're talking about ending same-sex marriage, abortion, reducing access to contraceptives, but also surrogacy, uh, no-fault divorce, sex education in public schools. Wow, look, this, uh, this is designed uh, not only to rally the left to me, but also to intimidate and silence Christians. But give me your reaction. Well, my first reaction is you've got two separate issue sets there. Uh, on the one, she talks about isolationism and opposition to immigration. And on the other, she talks about a series of what I would call family-oriented social conservative policies. Now, I want to go back to um, a book that I talked about before, Perry and Whitehead, which I have a lot of problems with. Um, but one of the things that I will say is that although I think they asked the wrong questions, they did handle their data, I would say, with, with a degree of integrity, and they found some interesting stuff. Um, you can ask the wrong questions and still find some interesting things. And one of the things they found is that among people that have what I would call, again, the social conservative attitudes, which they code as Christian nationalism, but let's ignore that for a second and just code that as, as social conservatism, there was a diametric split between two groups of people people that regularly attend church and people that don't regularly attend church. Among regular church attenders, they actually found less hostility toward those of different racial groups, toward immigrants, um, and, and toward those who I would say your white ethno-nationalists would regard as the other. Uh, there was less hostility toward those groups among those who regularly attend church. But there was more opposition to same-sex marriage, um, abortion. I don't know if they coded for surrogacy and no-fault divorce, but I think if they had, they would have found more opposition among the, that cohort. Now, among those who were socially conservative but did not attend church, what they found was the exact opposite. They were less conservative on what we call the family issues, and they're more conservative on issues, or, or more opposed, I would say, more negative toward those who have a different racial identity or are immigrants or so on and so forth. And so, the data quite simply does not show a conflation between those issues. Yes, social conservatives can hold both of those groups, but it's two separate groups of social conservatives. And the ones that go to church are the ones that are less likely to actually um, have negative views of immigrants. Now, I don't know how that codes for isolationism or interventionism in foreign policy, but as a guy who studies foreign policy, I would say that's a complicated issue and people come to different views, views on that for a variety of reasons that might have nothing to do with social conservatism. Well, the, uh, among others, and that's one example that, that we just had and a great answer there, but uh, you've seen it, they're all after uh, Speaker Mike Johnson for his Christian faith, yeah, calling him a Christian nationalist and all this kind of horrible stuff. But I mean, he's a Christian statesman who is certainly influenced and guided by his faith. Uh, right. That's no different from the liberal left being guided by their secular or uh, wh whatever worldview that they embrace. So uh, what, what should our viewers and listeners keep in mind when these type charges of Christian nationalism pop up? I would say, particularly with reference to Speaker Johnson, you know, and I've done some research on him and just kind of looked into him. Um, and I actually kind of wasn't surprised that he emerged as the consensus uh, choice. There's two things that I think everybody needs to understand about Mike Johnson. One is that everybody in the Republican caucus seems to like him. 
which which as we all know from the, the speaker fight uh last year that in and of itself is an incredible feat uh and we should be impressed impressed by that uh the other is and, and this really galls the left you know mike uh, johnson has the unmitigated temerity to be a fairly conventional southern baptist um and what that means is that yes he's quite conservative on family issues um yes he has um, you know, some some views that uh, people on the secular left would would be concerned about. But as a conventional Baptist, uh, he also stands in an over 200 year tradition of Baptists supporting religious liberty, going back to Baptists, um, you know, siding with Thomas Jefferson in, in the election of 1800 because of his support for religious liberty, uh, which is deeply ingrained into Baptist political thought. And Mike Johnson has put his money where his mouth is on that sense. You know, he worked for uh, the Alliance, what is now the Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, which are well, we got about 15 North seconds, Dr. Nolte. And so what I would say about Re this is that a commitment to religious liberty, if somebody's truly committed to li religious liberty, you never have to worry about them imposing Christianity because they want your freedom. They want to protect your freedom to believe or not believe as you choose. And that's what you should know about Mike Johnson. Thank you, Dr. A.J. Nolte from Regent University.